Hello, hello. This is Alex Burkett, co-founder of Omniscient Digital, a premium content marketing agency, and you are listening to the Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm talking to Brad Smith. Brad is the CEO of Codeless, Usurp, and Wordable. In this episode, we talk about scaling Brad's content marketing agency, Codeless, how to source thousands of writers to hire the top 1%, contrarian views on content strategy and content production, how to marry content promotion and link building with content production, and much more. We also talk about Hawaii, work-life balance, and intrinsic versus extrinsic ambition, and its impact on happiness. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Brad Smith. at a high level um what do you do or how do you describe what do you do i'll start with the easy ones <laughs> uh i was gonna say this this should be e- uh, easy in theory uh to, i uh, i'm an owner in three content marketing companies uh so my title or position is one thing but what i actually do most days is try to like solve problems basically and so I typically float a little bit and I tend to focus on in a weird way what's not working uh, or what should be working better or what's losing money or what's not as efficient as it could be or should be. Um, and it's almost like I, and the way I think of it is almost like a lot of R&D, if that makes any sense. Um, once it's working, I try to back out as soon as possible because I'm like a tinkerer and I like to constantly mess with things. And as you know, like once something's working well, and especially when you have like other people dependent on it or other people who are better suited to running it. Uh, someone, a personality like me gets in the way. So I try to like be hands off on things that are like, for the most part, working smoothly, have already been proven, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. So there's this idea of like the zero to one person and the one to 100 or like the builder and the scaler. It sounds yep. like you fall into that builder. Yes. Yeah. I probably, cause I was like, spent a lot of years just being broke and, uh, and like constantly messing with things. And also too, my background's weird in that I have like I, I went to school and studied finance. Uh, I got into marketing and got into like, uh, got my MBA uh, and got into like nerdy SEO stuff, but then wrote a lot and used writing as a way to almost like get my foot in the door. Um, and so I have a weird background in that I, I, I wouldn't, I'm like a really good generalist. Um, I could specialize in a couple areas like content or whatever, but I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm like a, you know, expert at finance or an expert at running an agency or an expert at writing. I'm kind of just like pretty good at a, few of those things. Have, have you leaned into that? Or does that uh, give you anxiety around being a generalist? Because I, I struggle with the used exact to. same thing. <laughs> I definitely relate to the the generalist uh, um, ethos. It used to give me an anxiety, especially too, when we were trying to figure out being a generalist is really hard at the beginning because you, you do have to specialize to a degree. So to get codeless off the ground initially, it was a struggle because I was too much of a generalist and I wanted to work with different types of clients and I wanted to do different types of services. And that is a problem when you're trying to scale a company. And so uh, I think over time, I've gotten better or more aware of like where that is a strength and where it's a weakness, if that makes any sense. And so I, totally. I think I, I think my own awareness uh, has helped me get more comfortable with it at certain times, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Why, uh, why, did, you, why did you start a content agency? What, what's the story about how that came to be? Yeah. So uh, by accident? No. So uh, I was doing a lot. I worked in house at a bunch of places and then started doing my own kind of solo consulting um, uh, for largely like a lot of SEO related stuff. So I was doing a lot of like SEO consulting. Uh, wanted, I got sick of, to be honest, got sick of like doing everything myself. Mm-hmm. And so then decided to join up with a partner and we were going to do more of like not a full service agency because I don't think those are uh, real uh, or good a lot of times for different reasons. You but, mean like um, when they do PPC, CRO, SEO, like everything yeah, exactly. across the board? Totally. Yeah, for every type of client. Uh, it's, it's usually like uh, that means they're pretty average or they need to have like 150 people. Or it's um, fucking chaotic internally, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And two, it's like you're doing everything at like a seven. You're like a nine in one of those, but you're like a seven or six in the other one. So 100%. if you're coming up against like an expert in one of those areas, then you'll 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 struggle. I, and there's a lot of, a lot of SERP related stuff today is winner take all. So that's a, a, another huge area we can go into. But so um, I, I, my, a really good friend of mine uh, was a developer and we decided to start an agent, started Codeless together. And it was going to be this agency that like, not just like built and designed websites, but also then optimized it over time for, mm. for growth. Um, so it'd be, so it was like a cool idea in theory. 
in practice, it wasn't a great idea because we didn't know how to sell, how to hire, how to position ourselves, how to reach enterprise clients who that type of thing would be a good fit for at the time. Because this was like, I don't know, eight plus years ago. And so we struggled a lot because I just didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. We both had like different things that were working separately or independent of each other. And then doing that in one company is really, really challenging. Um, at the time, I was doing a lot of freelance writing and just writing for free for on big, the biggest sites I could find to get attention to sell our other services. And it was mm-hmm. only when big, like legitimate companies and brands started paying me to write that I, the light bulb went off and I was like, oh, maybe we should do this. Cause it's all these like really awesome brands that, uh, and they were starting to, I realized there was enough of a market being created where you could actually make money on it too. And you could actually grow a company. Whereas like, again, eight, 10 years ago, the idea of like growing a company off just content in this space, it was, it was probably too early, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, it's matured like crazy. I think it's finally coming to fruition in the last two years or so, but um, I'm curious. So I've heard this story many times and it's, it's pretty similar with myself of going from uh, freelance consulting and content or SEO to thinking, wow, like there's, there's real demand for this and I can scale this up. So when you realize that, what were your first, second, third steps? Like, how did you, how did you go from, this is me doing this to this is my team doing this? Yeah, for sure. It was a lot of trial and error initially. So trial and error, meaning like uh, scaling content is hard. Um, and so I tried to like piecemeal it. I tried to hire, I probably did everything you did and everything other people did. I tried to like hire other, hire other subcontracts. Be like, okay, you just write this one and then I'll, you know, review it after. And it's not good or it's not, not good enough to what I was thinking or what the, so it's like, okay, that's not gonna work. So how about what if you just like outline these things for me, I'll keep writing and editing and that'll speed things up a little bit. And that worked to a little degree. And then it was just like figuring out how do I break down the entire content creation process into like steps. And this, again, I struggled with growing an agency initially because I sucked at all these things. I sucked at like building processes and all the boring like operation stuff. Slowly was able to get better at that. And at the same time realized like you can break down the article creation process into a series of defined steps and then train people into how you, uh, how you work on or improve each one of those things. And so then I slowly and eventually was able to find writers who could write and then I would edit and then eventually, you know, bring in an editor who oversees other people writing and I'm out of that day-to-day stuff too. So I initially, we, um, my, my business, to make a long story short, my business partner and I split up Codeless essentially. I just kept the name and the, so it's a, it's a name that describes a completely different service, you know, 10 years ago or eight years ago, right, right. but um. Uh, I had one other employee, uh, Jeremy, who now runs uh, Usurp, um, who, which we spun out a couple of years ago. But uh, I decided to hire a project manager as like one of who's Jen, who now runs like the day to day of Codeless. I decided to hire a project manager, like one of the first hires, other than Jeremy, who was doing a lot of the writing at the time, um, because I didn't like doing all that stuff, and I was still good at editing and writing. So that was kind of like my slow stumbling path to figuring out how to scale it was. Um, what am I, what, where, what is my skill set best suited to? And then keep hold of that for as long as possible before like eventually backing out of everything. So at the start, did you rely heavily on like freelance writers and contractors or did you start to for sure. you know, build an in-house team or how did you approach it? Uh, both. So we, a lot of tried to, a lot of freelancers, um, the, the piecemeal approach that I just described is very difficult to do with contractors or freelancers, especially people who aren't full time. And that's where, um, we relied on a mix. We still rely on a mix actually to this day for different reasons. Cause sometimes uh, you get clients in different spaces where you need like that unique expertise and you don't already have it in house. And so it's easier to hire like a really good freelancer just to kind of like come in and fill that gap for you. Um, so yeah, we did a mix of those. And then in house, we found it was easier to train someone on the very specific things we wanted. And even now, I usually say to companies like there's no right or wrong answer to in house freelance freelancers agencies like each one has their pros and cons and it just kind of depends on what you want what type of content you're doing all that stuff yeah yeah i've talked to many different people and it seems like there's a heavy mix and i feel like it also depends on the stage of the company you're at like it feels sure. like there's marginal benefits to hiring in-house as you scale because you can kind of like lower the cost of of each piece but like at the beginning yep. it's really like hitting those specific subject matter expertise nodes and that's hard to do with like one in-house writer you know for sure. Um, and the type, yeah, the type of work, like you mentioned also too, like, where's the client that we're looking at bringing these people on for? Like, what is their situation? Are, is this a huge campaign they're committed to for a year plus? 
If so, I'll hire people full time. If it's like a big push they're trying to do for a quarter or six months, then it's like, well, we'll see. You know, maybe I won't jump straight into full time. Maybe we'll we'll figure out how to like because we by definition we might need to ramp those people up and down because the volume is going to go like this over the course of that engagement. Totally. Can you tell me more about this piecemeal approach to content creation? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, basically, an article most good articles in the tech space follow a fairly similar format. So they're usually around 2000 words, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, Even if they're more, they typically follow the same type of style and approach and tone and all that kind of stuff. Um, The intros and the conclusions should more or less look fairly the same. The, The headline structures usually more or less look fairly the same. So again, every client or every company will have like their own unique spin on that. Um, but I think what we were able to do was say, okay, here's how intros should look in general. Here's what you're trying to do with them. Here's how, what each section of content should have. Here's what the H2s should more or less look like. Here's how you should write them. Um, you should write them like a headline. Uh, here's, here's how like some of the, like the body section of content, where does that information come from? It doesn't come from like a writer's head necessarily. It comes from, uh, research in an ideal world. And it comes from like, uh, you interviewed an expert or you have a quote, you have an image or two that serve as an, not as a stock image, but as a concrete example of the problem you're trying to describe. Um, the whole article format in our case, a lot of times follows like problem agitate solution, depending on, again, the, the type of like piece of content or query or whatever we're focusing on. So in other words, there's a lot of these like consistent principles that should be incorporated into every piece of content that then can be customized depending on like to fit each client. Um, so that's what, like, how can we train writers on this style and, and these practices? Um, because if you can train them like that, then we're not rel- as reliant on like the, the quote unquote unicorn writer, which doesn't exist by the way, but like the unicorn writer that you're going to find for that one company or that one client that just happens to be an amazing fit, doesn't need any training at all. I, I think a lot of people, a lot of companies, especially underestimate how much writing is just like, and scaling writing is just like scaling any other thing in your organization. It's training, it's principal processes, it's operations, it's all that boring stuff. So in terms of uh, like tactically how you scale that, that template of sorts, is this via like content briefs, content outlines? Like, do you have some sort of a structure for these that you give for yep. each kind of client and each kind of writer or how do you yeah, for sure. translate that? Yeah. So we do, uh, we have like the initial training that is like, okay, here's what our style is. Uh, content quality is subjective. Uh, I hope it, I wish it wasn't, but it is. And so we were like, okay, we need to define for ourselves what content quality means so that we don't have one client tell us a content piece is bad, but the other client would say it's good because it's, it sounds different to each one. Like Mm -hmm. usually when clients are, are talking about content quality, it's stylistically, it's not like actually, is this good or bad? And so we wanted to define for ourselves, what is a good piece of content? And what are all the variables? And then from there, to your point, um, for each client, we might have like templates. And a lot of times those templates are either based on the client or they're based on the type of content or the query. So for example, you know, like a top of the funnel how-to article might have one type of template versus like a bottom of the funnel uh, best XYZ, more affiliate commercially, you know, driven uh, type of piece of content. That'll have a different template, which just might be like a standard template that could be plugged in for any type of client at any given time. And then from there, the content brief will be like the the specific example to one topic. Um, From the content brief gets fleshed out to an outline, then we'll have an outline review, then we do the draft, then we have draft review. Pretty pretty similar from there to most like content operations. And you you mentioned uh, some of these sections have quotes with experts and subject matter expert interviews and stuff. Do you put that in the brief too? Or how how do you kind of leverage that in addition to the template? Yeah, the bad answer is it depends. Uh, mm-hmm. The long answer uh, depends. And the reason I say that is because like, if um, I'm trying to think of an example, if it's like cybersecurity and it's a super technical space, then we'll often want a technical lead. Uh, in addition to anyone we can source, a technical lead on the client side to give us feedback. Because it's like, look, we're finding experts in this is really difficult. Uh, another mm-hmm. example would be finance because finance is really difficult. It's really, um, it's really, uh, it's a really a strange legal space. burdens and stuff like that. Yeah, a ton of regulations, and also too, it's like I love what a client's like. Oh, can't you just get like an uh, like an expert investment banker to like write this piece of content? And it's like, well, right. they're busy making a lot of money. They're not going to be freelance writing in the free time, so that doesn't really work in practice. You got to find like good finance writers, 
uh, who then can like ex who can interview someone like a technical expert or like a finance expert, um, or can we source that information? So yeah, it usually just depends on like the space they're in, style of work, or the style of the content they also want to see. Sometimes clients are like, actually, don't mention anyone else in the space. Like, just mention our company and just mention like our product, and they want it to be a little more, I don't know, insular, I guess, in a way. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Like some of this content, where if you're mark, if you're like HubSpot or like if you're a marketer marketing to marketers, yeah. you can hire writers that are good marketers and they kind of know the yep. space, like they're writing for their own audience. But with, cl- with some, we've had some clients that are in technical spaces that are selling to developers or IT. And at that point, I almost think you need to invest in this strategy that John Bonini talks about. This like content marketers as journalists approach, right? Yeah. Like they they need to kind of think totally differently about how they construct the piece where it's like lending the expertise. And I feel like there's always going to be a little gulf, but like, how can you bridge yeah. that through the people you talk to? For sure. Yeah. I kind of came around on that too. Cause I was, I was a, a marketer who marketed to marketers. Like that's how I got started writing. Uh, cause I just, and I the only reason I was a good writer is because I had like a long time of experience of actually doing marketing to people. So it was very easy for me to do that. But over time it, I had that realization of like, oh, well, it's not, we shouldn't actually be hiring experts. A lot of times you can't hire experts or it's just not practical to hire experts. Um, and so therefore like, what's a better approach to what you're saying? I think too, it depends on the, the style of content. So if it's something that's very bottom of the funnel or very unique to that company, or it's about their point of view. That's when you. That's when a company should hire an in-house writer and not even try to go down the scaling with an outside team, because because they're going to be so particular about how it sounds, how it comes across, what is or isn't said. Uh, there's so much nuance and gray area involved that it's like you're better off just hiring in-house, training them, uh, really get them to like drink the Kool Aid, so to speak. Uh, agencies are better if like you lack the expertise or you need scale and volume, and it's usually a lot easier to scale top of the funnel content with, you know, very little domain expertise, if Mm -hmm. that makes sense. It's an easier problem to solve than like, how do I write, you know, a manifesto or something about how, like, I don't know how someone's changing the finance space. Like I'm, you know, that's, that's so hard to do by anyone outside. And again, a lot of times it's because like, we don't have the ability to train those people properly. Like you would an in-house person, you don't have the time. Mm -hmm. So actually that ties back to something you said before that I wanted to ask about, which is this, this subjectivity or the style of the piece. Um, I have some thoughts on that. I I think people (laughs) tend to like overemphasize that when the audience almost never cares about the passive versus active voice. (laughs) No, trust me nuts. Yeah. So when, when a client is very adamant about that stuff, is that like kind of a, a, you know, canary in the coal mine that they maybe should just hire an in-house person or like, how do you, how do you approach those questions when they come up or those, that, that feedback where it's like, Oh, this, this isn't my voice or like, this isn't the style we're hoping to write in. For sure. So we try to do a few things that I'll go through to like bridge that gap. Um, if it's still an issue, uh, we probably part ways with them. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so it's, it's you as an outside vendor, we can't, I would love to, but we can't solve people's problems for them. So if they have, like, if they aren't clear on what those things are, if the st- what the style they want, the tone they want, if they aren't clear internally, so you probably get this, like where you have two people on the same team giving you conflicting feedback, mm-hmm. um, like we can't solve someone else's operational issues. And so therefore it's probably just not going to be a good long-term fit because we're going to be banging our head against the wall. And I've been doing client services for like a decade now. So I think I'm, I've gotten to the point where I'm jaded enough where it's like, Uh, let's just fire him and get someone else in, you know, like, let's just like, I'm not, I don't have artificial growth goals, like a company that where everything's bootstrapped that we do. So it's not like we have these goals that I have to stick to. Mm -hmm. uh, And like, I have to hit these profit bill or revenue metrics because I'm going to sell the company. Like I'm not selling the company tomorrow. I don't, I don't have an investor to answer to. I'd rather just fire the client and have a happier life. So that's, we'll put that aside. Um, What we try to do with clients is we try to like be super upfront about this and say, look, a lot of this is going to be stylistic. Um, let's figure out ways to bridge the gap. But we're going to test multiple writers initially with different styles purposely. Because a lot of times, if clients don't know what they want, they know what they don't want. So we'll show you three versions of something, and you're probably not going to like one or two of those in most cases. Then that'll help us figure out, oh, okay, you don't like the overly formal writer. Or conversely, you don't like the snarky informal writer. Mm-hmm. Um, from there, we try to document, like, don't tell us, you don't like the sound of something, tell us exactly what you don't like about it. So I don't like when, uh, I don't know, like you use too many, con- I don't know, conjunctions and like the sentences are too long and the phrasing is too long and it becomes clunky and wordy. That's fine. Like we could do something with that. Or um, 
how, or we also have like a feedback form that says like, how do you like how these images are formatted? Yes or no. Do you like when these M dashes are used versus whatever? Uh, do you, uh, yes or no. And then if you don't highlight on the document specific places where, um, you would say it differently or you would you would think about something differently. So I guess we just try to like, we try to separate out the fuzzy, intangible, like this doesn't sound right to me type of feedback versus the actual concrete actionable stuff we can do of like format something different, sentence case versus title case. Uh, we try to like have, you know, of these four options for these types of things, what do you like or don't you like? And then that goes into like a style guide uh, and then we try to edit and manage to that, those standards. So even if, you know, six months from now, someone says, oh, I don't love this. And so we say, okay, that's fine. Let's compare it to the style guide. And does the style guide need changing then? Because that's what we're using to train the editors and the writers on. Yeah. So I, I love that approach or that process of like, you're getting fast feedback and it's almost like this growth mindset in the early days of an engagement. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I have some high level thoughts here that I just want to throw out. So like oftentimes in uh, the sales process, like I, I try to explain the value of doing these longer term engagements, right? Like getting a six month yep. or 12 month contract. And there's, yep. there's probably this inherent pushback. It's like, oh yeah, that's great for your cash flow, But like, what does that yeah. do for us? <laughs> but it, it really is like when you put it that way, it's such a win-win, like when your incentives are aligned, because there's always going to be that month or two in the beginning when you know you're kind of getting your bearings, you start to learn. There's a lot more handholding. And the goal is that by like month three, four, five, six, you're kind of off and running and doing your own thing because you've reached that agreement through the trial and error. Yeah. But it sounds like you guys have a pretty cool process for that, which is awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, it's pretty good. You know, it's never perfect in an agency and it's never perfect because you're always, we talked about this a second ago, maybe before we started recording, but you're always, we're always reacting at the end of the day mm -hmm. to what like each client and not all clients are right. Just like, we're not right about everything. Like if 10 clients are telling us to do it one way and one client wants it another way, well, it's like, well, pro probably like we'll do it that way, but it's not like the norm or it's not usual. So we, we try to, we try to get better at it over learning these lessons the hard way because we, we tried to like, you know, not guarantee, but we try to, you know, guarantee out of the gate, like, Hey, we're going to, we know exactly what you need. Uh, that's not realistic. And so it's not, un we try to also tell people it's not uncommon to have all your month one content get finalized by like the end of month two right? or get delivered late initially because we're working through all these kinks. And that's where you want to your point, you want to work out the kinks up front in the first quarter so that by month six or 12, we're way ahead on content. Like that's where we want to be. We don't want to be struggling with issues six months from now because that's when it's going to be a, a much bigger problem of like the client being like should i have even chosen this agency do i need to start over with someone else or us being like we should have fired this client three months ago they're paying like they never you know like what we're doing so yeah yeah and that's that's always like the wildest thing when somebody suggests oh let's just do a test like month or like four articles at a time like and you don't get to do you yeah. know any customer research or any sort of interviews with them it's like hey just take these topic ideas and write them we're always like yeah that's, we, that's yeah. not gonna work i, I don't think that's we gonna... tried that no we totally tried that so back in the early days i was like well let's just do like a paid test so as long as someone pays like for one article and understands that it's going to be difficult to like get up and running um then we'll be fine. And what I realized was like, why are we losing money and losing clients? And it's like, cause that doesn't work. <laughs> like you can't just do one article. Um, or uh, when we say we're going to do one article, I'm assuming we're going to get like 70% of the way there on the first article. And the client is thinking I'm paying for this. I'm expecting 90% of the way there. And that was always like one of those things where it was just like a, a bad um, expectation setting both ways that only can really be solved in a sustainable way with more of a long-term engagement, even though that's self-serving for both of us. Totally. Totally. So there was another piece that you mentioned on this that I want to touch on, which is you said you have maybe a couple different writers who try out different styles on each piece. Um, I think that's a strength. That's something that you can do. It's it's harder to do in-house. You can still do it if you have a big enough yep. team, but that's where the contractor value comes in is you can get different specialties, different voices, people who are less or more adaptable, people who specialize in formal voice, et cetera. Um, that requires a lot of fielding of talent. And this is yes. a good segue because one one note that I actually did write down for this is you did a podcast on uh, voices of search. Um, and I think you talked about this idea of how to source thousands of writers and only hire the yes. top 1%. Can you tell me how to, how to source thousands <laughs> of writers? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. To your point, I think um, two things, like we use different types of writers and different 
for different reasons. And so we might pay more for some content and less for other pieces of content just for different, like we might scale top of the funnel content with one writer and bottom of the funnel content with different types of writers and pay scales are different. So it's like you, I, I advocate, you need this like mixed approach. Um, we, it's very difficult. Everyone's problem and bottleneck is finding good writers, especially we tend to do a lot of like high volume engagements, which I kind of like to do because it's almost like a big puzzle mm-hmm. that you're trying to figure out with these big companies. But the challenge of that is you need a ton of writers to, to do that properly. And if you're trying to like scramble and hire writers in the same month that you need the content, uh, it's never going to work. So that's another you know problem I've learned the hard way. But so we, uh, we had all these problems that we were struggling with. It was taking up too much of my personal time, or it was taking up too much of our like highest paid people, frankly, internally, like our highest paid editors were having to do way too much work with like reviewing brand new writers. And so it just wasn't, it wasn't a scalable process. And so we figured out a way to say, okay, let's again, break it down into like whatever five to 10 steps. And we have to push people through these five or 10 steps. And if, and if they get out the other side, then there, there's like an 80% chance of them sticking around for long term. So we might be giving writers like paid articles to do, and uh, they still not might might not make it all the way and might not be hired full time. So we test everyone with paid work, part time or contract first before hiring them full time. And it might be might last one month. It might last like three months. Um, there, I tell people to hire writers like to hire salespeople. Hire like three, knowing you're going to keep one. Because mm-hmm. you don't you don't really know what you want if they're going to be a good fit outside of just their style. Um, so what this requires is a lot of stuff at the top of the funnel, and then like a very good process to fu- to pull people out of that or disqualify people as soon as possible, so that you don't have your highest paid editors having to review a ton of stuff. You want to like limit the amount of work they're having to do, and so we did that by like okay, ton of job board ads everywhere. Uh, everywhere where we could possibly find freelance writers, or if we're hiring project management writers, like project management specific places. Uh, so sorry to interrupt, we, but how, what are the yeah, yeah. specific, jo- are there specific job boards you found um, bring in good candidates, especially for writers, but project managers too? Yeah, for sure. Uh, off the top of my head, so I don't uh, run these a lot anymore day to day, but a lot of these are like pro bloggers, always pretty decent, mm-hmm. um, uh, especially for the cost. Um, we work remotely is pretty decent too. Um, uh, there's a couple writing, any writing specific Slack groups are pretty decent too. Like those types of places tend to find pretty good stuff. Mm-hmm. What you're looking for is a balance between um, volume or number of applicants coming in, uh, the quality of those, and then the cost. So what doesn't scale well for this operation is something like LinkedIn, where you're paying per applicant, I think, or per click. Like Indeed and the or something. <laughs> and the quality sucks. Yeah, exactly. The quality sucks. We're also too, if we're, if we're hiring like this for this purpose, Indeed, those places don't work because those are like in-house full-time people. Right. And we we kind of want like the hustlers who have already have a little bit of experience freelancing because they tend to be a lot more focused on like output, if that makes any sense. Totally. So we want like writers, like workhorses in an agency. We don't have the time, like a SaaS company might, to like bring someone on and slowly ramp them up to like three articles a week, two articles a week, you know? Right. Like we right. don't have, they have the, like a three month onboarding and training. Thing, yeah, exactly. And then eventually they we're write one article. For, yeah. Yeah. We're kind of looking for people that have already had that experience of like hustling a little bit. And so totally. that's where indeed those types of places don't really work. It's not a good um, fit for those. So usually it's fairly techy. Uh, places like angel list for us haven't necessarily been a good fit for whatever reason. It might be partly us. Um, it might also be partly the the type of people that are there or that are looking for writing roles. It's, writing roles are different than like hiring a marketer or hiring a designer totally. or it's unique. So um, so it's usually a mix is the short answer. It's usually, it's not just one job board. If we have a big client in a very hard space, uh, we'll headhunt. So that's where we'll go look at like big finance, you know, like, I don't know, we'll go look at like big... Uh, like, I don't know, Seeking Alpha or Yahoo Finance or all those. And then we'll go ahead hunt and look at like, who's actually writing? Are they, do they, do they write? If they're a journalist, do they also write for paid gigs on the side? Um, we'll he- and that also depends on the budget of the client. So if the budget for the client isn't there because they don't want to pay enough, then we can't do that. We have to go for a different approach. So it's just, so I guess that's the short answer is like, it's a spray and pray approach. The, the, it's, it's very hard to find one good writer it's easier if you just look at a lot of writers to find one good writer. Mm-hmm. 
So how do we spray and pray a little bit? And then we use a series of like checkpoints, which we can get into, but one of them off the bat is like, we'll ask for LinkedIn URL. If they give us, and we'll make it optional. If they don't give us LinkedIn URL, we disqualify them. If they <laughs> don't give us, if they give us like their personal portfolio site, we disqualify them. Then we say, give us published sample. We, we put a few things in the initial very first, like, you know, uh, initial form that if they don't, give it to us exactly like we're asking for, they get disqualified before you even look at their sample. Because if they're not, we're a remote company, we can't probably like you guys, we can't babysit people. We can't like, and we're all in different time zones. Like we have to work asynchronously. You you need us. We're looking for a style of writer as much as can they write on the subject. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that resonates. I, I do the same thing with Pro Blogger and I put in, I call them brown M&Ms clauses. Because I think that it was Van Halen or one of those bands would always say like, remove all the brown M&Ms from, from our yeah. M&M jar <laughs> because, and then would yeah. fire the person that didn't do that. And it wasn't that they cared about brown M&Ms. They just wanted somebody who was really akin to like the details. And uh, I do that with my job ads. I'll put in silly things like th- say this exact subject line, exactly yep. three pieces. Don't give me a portfolio. Um, tell me your favorite album or something like that. Cause then I can, it's, it's very easy stuff. It's not like I'm asking to write, you know, like a book or something like that. But as soon as yeah. I see that they didn't do it, I'm like, Oh, you didn't read the ad. And like, if you can't read the ad, you're not going to read the instructions when I send a content outline or something like that. So it's a very good first layer filtering mechanism. Yeah. It it filters out a depressingly large number of people. Yep. Like it filters out like, I don't know, 50%, like right off the bat. So let's say, so if I'm hiring like one writer, like I said, if we're trying to do like the 1% type of idea, like we need to look at hundreds of people, uh, uh, like okay, so how do I disqualify these people as quickly as possible? Because I just want like one or two good ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, right off the bat, you're going to disqualify 50% with that. And then from there, how many of the samples they give you are not in the topic you're asking for? Right. That's probably another 20, 20% of people right there. And then all of a sudden, your editor or whoever, they really only have to look at like, oh, sorry, from there, also what's availability, uh, number of articles per week on average, uh, cost per cost. rate. So usually, and the number of articles per week, again, we ask because it's like, is this someone who thinks they're going to write one article a week? Uh, we just kind of ask it open-endedly just to see what they say. And it's because like, again, in an agency, you can't, unfortunately, you can't do that. Or you can, but it's it's harder to manage a bunch of writers doing one article a week. It's just a pain. You, so, you want a higher capacity and to work with the f- fewest possible writers doing the most possible work. Yeah, exactly. Just 100%. out of complexity. And then, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's more of a drag. It's just a drag in a number of areas. Like the client thinks they really like that one writer, but that one writer can't write more than one article a week. So we can't actually scale them up. Um, It creates more, just more writers in total for account managers and other people to manage or editors get feedback to. If it's there, if they're only doing one a week, they're probably doing it as a side gig or in their free time, which means they're not that invested. And so you can't actually like give them feedback and expect them to get a whole lot better over time. Like they're just going to get marginally or incrementally better. So it creates a number of issues. So we th- that's another, those are like objective, quantifiable things that you can ask for. And we'll often do like our initial form. Do they make it past that? Yes. We might send a second form to get the second thing of feedback that then further either qualifies them or disqualifies them before we even have an editor look at published samples. I don't want to talk to a writer if, if, uh, if, if they're asking for like, you know, 500 grand a year. Because it's like, okay, that's not going to work for our budget. So I don't want to get invested. And be like, oh, I love this writer. I love their style. I love their whatever. And then be like, oh, okay. They think that this is like a, I don't know, like a brain surgery type gig. <laughs> like this yeah, is not, totally. Unfortunately, that's unfortunately not what we're doing. We're just, you know. So you can, you can disqualify easily 70 to 80% of people if you do this. Meaning your editors, your highest paid people, whoever's doing the reviewing only has to look at like, you know, a two, three dozen samples to then pick out the top five or 10, that then you're paying to test. And then you're kind of, you, you want to spend your time focusing on the people who are the best fit, not the people who aren't a good fit, you know? Right. So there's, there's this point I keep driving home. I've said it in like the last six podcasts, but it's this point of via negativa. Um, so oftentimes people look at like what they can add or like uh, pile onto something, uh, whether they're, you know, trying to get fit or, you know, build an yeah. experimentation program or, or whatever it is, but it's often more effective to look at what you can exclude or subtract. And I think this yep. is a perfect example because if I just imagine like what I would be looking for in terms of a writer that's like via additiva, I don't know what that would be, but like via positiva, yeah, yeah. I guess, um, you know, it's like good, 
but what does good mean? Like, how do I, how do I know how to define that or like filter that? But I do know what is not good. I do know what I don't want. So if I can just filter out as much exclusion as possible, then I can get to the point where I can actually deal with a handful of people where I can put a little more, more subjective, more hands-on approach to like, uh, you know, looking through those applicants. For sure. And we've, over time, we've, I think we've done a better job of realizing like what we're, what aspect of content we're really good at and what, what that means for our clients. In other words, like what our clients are looking for and get the most value out of. And then therefore that dictates like how we should work and our, and then what our writers, how our writers are a good fit or aren't a good fit. So in other words, there's a lot of times we don't work with writers or stop working with writers that are really good writers, like Mm -hmm. probably arguably better at the act of writing uh, than other people we use or work with just because they're not a good fit for the style of work. And they're not, and and that's like, it just is what it is, you know? Like it's not, it doesn't mean that they're personally not a good writer. It doesn't don't mean we don't like them or they're not, it's, not, it's not a good fit for this very unique problem we're trying to solve for clients, you know, on behalf of clients. And, and not a good fit, you mean that would be specific to like maybe tone of voice or like if they're like writing long form and you need short form or like a specific industry. Not or... even that. It could even be like just like work habits. Like mm-hmm. someone, like the writer who has a million Slack questions every time you give them an assignment. Right, right. Or like so wants, to hop on a, wants to hop on a, yeah, I mean, that's just like one glaring example. So not everyone's like that. But if a writer's not a good fit tone wise for one client, that's okay. They're probably going to be a good fit for another one or for us internally. Like we have our own internal projects. I'm, I uh, get a lot more, more leeway to writers in that sense. Like I like seeing different styles. I like when people are whatever, like snarky. I like when people show more personality. A lot of clients don't. A lot of clients want you to be boring. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so it might just be something as simple as like, Hey, uh, we like working with you. We can't keep answering this many questions mm-hmm. based on the rate we're paying you. Uh, because our editors also have a lot of work to do and we're on opposite time zones and we can't jump on a zoom call every time you have a question. So like, that's probably going to be an issue for you. And it's kind of being an issue for us. So is it, is this better just to like part ways respectfully, even though we love you and love your work and everything else. It's not like, it's not a quality issue. Again, for most companies think it's a quality. It's not a quality issue. It's just like a, it's just not a good style of work for our business model and everything else. For sure. So I'm imagining this, I think you use the word funnel actually, or top of the funnel, this funnel of writers. Yep. Yep. And there's this top layer where you're just trying to like source as many people as possible. And that's probably the highest rate of exclusion based on the principles we just talked about, like the via negativa, yep. the brown m M&M stuff. Um, there's a second layer potentially of contract writers, people who you actually move forward with a test assignment. Maybe there's even a second like a, a kind of split layer in there where you have like a, a tier of contract writers who are kind of like on deck or like can, you know, work with a, a client here if you need them. And then is the yeah. bottom of the funnel, like you're, you're trying to push these really good contractors into full-time writers. Is that, do I have that mostly right? Ideally. Yeah. Yeah. Ideally. So, um, and then even too, even if they're looking for a full-time gig out of the gates, we'll start them with paid tests mm-hmm. and we don't actually interview writers either upfront. Uh, we only, we only interview them if we're going to hire them full time. Like this might be three months down the road of working together. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is again, it becomes like an interview for a a role like writing is largely, they can go off too many red herrings and, and signals that don't actually relate to, are they a good writer and do they work in the system or not? So like, uh, someone's personality or how they give me an answer to something doesn't tell me if they can meet deadlines, write about certain topics intelligently, spot problems before they happen. Like you only find those things after actually working together. So uh, a lot of the times we want to actually work with people. It might be a different for different roles. If it's like a senior role, then obviously we're we're interviewing people. We're going to those extra degrees. It becomes too time consuming and cost intensive to do that in the initial qualification stages. So we actually don't interview at all um, until they've kind of like, it's kind of sink or swim to be completely honest with you. And once you've proven you can hang, then then that's when we start investing the time, do the interviews, want to figure out, hey, what are you doing now? Do you have another gig? Are you writing for how many other clients are you writing for? Okay, cool. Like, uh, are they paying you a lot? Can we pay you more? Can we bring you on full time? Like how, that's when it usually starts with those kind of conversations to like really invest the time to, because we already, by that point, we already know it's a really good fit, you know? Do you, um, I think I can rock getting people from that um, application layer to the contract writer layer. 
do you struggle sometimes with getting people from the contract layer to full time? People who are like yeah. used to being freelancers who want to stay freelancers. Like, do you ever yes. have trouble pushing yeah. them into a full time role? We do. We do. Our our the way we try to structure those roles is uh, our sales pitch is like we want to we want to make this. We want to give you all the positive aspects of freelancing without all the negative aspects. Mm-hmm. So in other words, I don't care when you work, how you work, how often you want to talk to us. Uh, we won't make you email people. We won't make you sit on Slack. Um, you can travel, you can do whatever you want. We're not, but on the flip side of that is we're not going to, we're going to give you good clients. And if the clients are bad, we're going to fire the clients before you have an issue with them. Kind of like if there's that big of an issue, we'll just get rid of them. Cause like I said, I don't, this is a very much a lifestyle business. This isn't like, you don't, you're, you're uh, if you're trying to s- selling an agency, we just bought a software company. Uh, selling an agency is not often a good deal for a number of reasons. You get lower valuations, you have to sign non-competes, you kind of kill your golden goose. There's all these like various problems with it. So for me, it's not like a get rich quick tomorrow to kind of scheme running an agency. So um, it's it's very much built around like our personal kind of happiness and workflow and where we think we have value. And so for those people, it's like, hey, we'll give you all the benefits of a freelance role in that you don't have to like answer to people. You don't have to jump on phone calls with clients if you don't want to. Um, we'll take all that stuff off your plate. We'll also take off your plate though, like chasing clients for payments, uh, having to pitch yourself to new clients. Like we'll take all that off your plate too. So how can we, does that sound like something interesting to you? And if so, or if not, like how can we potentially bridge that gap? So it just kind of becomes like a, an honest conversation with people. And sometimes they're like, no, I'm still good. We still want to be separate. And then we go, okay, that's fine. Can we at least have like 50% of your time or 75% of your time? Because they might have those one or two clients they love and want to keep working with or, and, and they want to stay separate. Or again, like uh, someone's been freelancing a long time, health insurance is expensive. Can we bring you on full time? We'll pay you well and give you health insurance. Like are there, are there other things in your life that you want other than flexibility? And can we bridge the gap on those? That's awesome. Um, do you want to talk about the? Uh, co- do you want to talk about Codeless and Usurp? Maybe the difference between those two, how they fit in together, sure. and potentially Wordable as well. Yeah, definitely. So Usurp is a PR and link building agency. I think we spun it out of Codeless, like if I had to guess, two years ago, two three years ago now. Um, we, like most content agencies, do we we work with a lot of big clients on a lot of big sites, and then we had other clients asking us to include them in articles on those big sites. And that never sat well with me because I was like, well, these people are paying me to like create something just for them. Uh, it feels immoral or dishonest to like shove in other people paying me to like, you know, slip in there. And it's, it's super common in this space. And so I was like, I'm not opposed to doing that for people. I'm just, I'm opposed to doing that for people who are already paying me because mm-hmm. uh, it's like, I'm going against their best interest, if you know, if you see what I mean. So mm-hmm. that never sat well with me, but at the same time, I see the value in it. And we also see this problem with clients where they're like, oh, well, we're doing all this content. Um, how come like traffic is down? And we're like, well, I don't know. What are you doing to promote it? <laughs> like, we're not, you're paying us to create content. You're not paying us to promote it and distribute the content. So you can't therefore like get mad at us because traffic sucks or your domain authority sucks to begin with or whatever. So how do we solve all these problems? And how do we, how do we solve that problem of like, we'll create the content and then we'll do the distribution for it. And that's where usurp came about. And it's, we tried it in house as like a separate division or department, and it just is really difficult. And it's it was really diff- it's a different it's a different enough of a business model and style of work that you can't share resources. So you can't share resources of people like an account manager who's managing the content creation process also then can't manage the pitching process uh, because it's like two different worlds, two different ways of thinking, two different skill sets. And so we thought actually it's going to be a lot cleaner and easier if we just treat it completely separate, allow the two teams to work together when it makes sense for clients and make that seamless, but we're not going to like force it. And that's maybe a a learning I had going back to like Codeless kind of 1.0 when I had a business partner and we tried to do development services and design services and SEO services and content all under one umbrella. It just becomes really difficult. And I... I in, in in saying that I'm running a lifestyle business, I, that doesn't mean I don't care about being really good at it. Mm-hmm. So I don't I don't want to like run a full service agency that's pretty average across the board and doesn't actually help people. And we're just like trading on our name in the space, you know. Like it's important to me that we are doing good work, that we are helping people, and that we are one of the 
best or better options in this area, that's important to me. So let's split it apart. It'll work more efficiently on its own, which it does like a million times, you know, a million percent it does. So I think, I mean, for other agencies, even I would recommend like incubate these ideas and prove them under the same umbrella. But then when you realize that it's a different skill set, different type of people, different roles, like it's, it's so much cleaner and easier to split it off once it's already assuming it's already working, you know? Yeah. I feel like it's one of those things that you start to feel the problems with as you scale. Like when you're at yep. 10 or 20 clients, you can often maintain a totally. lot of this stuff, but then you, you start to feel the breaking points. And that's the point at which you're like, should I spin this off into some dedicated entity? But I like that you still have yeah. some cross collaboration because I feel like there there's sometimes some uh, synergy between like what you're producing and the linkability of of that stuff, right? Especially for totally. boring content and boring spaces, it's like there's there's some yep. content that's just really hard to link to. But if you can get yep. the content team to produce some piece of original research, then it's like, oh, okay, this is much easier to link out. Totally. Yeah, totally. I can't tell you the amount of times on the link side, even we have a conversation with a client, and and it's like, yeah, we can get a lot of links to this article. Uh, this article, the problem is that this article or piece of content doesn't match search intent. Mm-hmm. or doesn't match like so it's not going to rank like so we'll just tell people like we can build all the links we want it's not going to help you like you need to your problem yes your problem is links but your, your other problem your, your achilles heel over here is the content needs to be better in these different ways or needs to be different um so there is a ton of synergy between the two we see both problems on both sides where on the content side uh it's a small site to start with and they're in a competitive space this is super common with like uh tech companies that have raised a bunch of money so it's like Yes, you raised a bunch of money. Uh, yes, you're awesome. Uh, but your domain existed for about three months. And we have no, like, we need to get that domain authority and recognition and everything else up uh, before we're ever going to get this content to rank in a really competitive space. So they need links and they need a ton of like PR and that sort of thing. On the other side, on the flip side, we see the same problem where it's like we can build as many links as we want to something. If the content isn't good, A, or if it's not aligned to like, what the search intent is, uh, we see this all the time with like a company will have like a product page that they're trying to rank when everything else is like a comparison or a how-to article or something. So it's like, yeah, well, uh, that sounds good in theory, but like it's not going to line up search intent. Therefore, it's probably going to always have this glass ceiling in terms of rankings. And so we need to redo the content or beef it up a little bit to your point earlier of like proprietary information, some unique statistics, some survey data, like something interesting going on there that'll make it a lot easier to go pitch to other people. Gotcha. Um, I want to circle back to something you mentioned when we first started the conversation around you being a sort of problem solver or utility player across these companies. What do you think when uh, thinking about scaling, uh, it could be codeless, user, wordable, what do you think are the problems you've left to solve? Like what are, what are the itchy things that you're just looking to kind of like tackle at this point? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, with the, it's a good co- the agency business model, I have it down to a degree, not that I'm like the best at it or not that I'm running like a hundred million dollar agency or anything like that, but how do you like get one off the ground? I've got that down. How do you get it from like zero to a couple million in revenue? Like I got that down. So, um, when it came to starting usurp, usurp, did in revenue in 18 months and in growth, what it took me like eight years or seven years to do with Codeless. And so it's just kind of one of those progressions where you learn all those mistakes and stuff. Um, Now it's a different problem because under Codeless, especially we're building out like the middle management and we're building out the infrastructure to like take that next leap or jump, I guess. And so that's uh, a unique challenge um, because we have, I'm getting further and further away from like any actual work. Uh, and the people that are doing all the work, uh, almost never hear from me, or if they do, it's, it's usually not even about what they're, what they're doing or what they're working on every day. So it's a weird dynamic now where it's like my role has evolved and changed a lot with Wordable. It's different because the different business model. So I would say I'm still making a lot of, it's been in the past year. I've still made a lot of like beginner ish mistakes because I've never, you know, run a SaaS business before. And I'm, I'm acting as the product manager, although I never have any direct experience in product management. And so I'm kind of like learning that stuff on the fly, um, largely because it's my time and money and you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's not a big deal, but, and thankfully it's not like taking a while to figure something out when it's like your third thing is not that big of a deal. Cause it's like my lifestyle has been changed. Whereas it's, it's very difficult problem when 
uh, you're trying to like pay the bills and support your family and, you, and it's not working. That's a totally different type of problem. So I, it's weird, I guess my, to answer, that's a rambling answer, but I guess my, my short answer would be like my role, figuring out where, what is needed for everyone and what, how does my role evolve based on that? In other words, like I'm becoming more of like a coach in a way for other people to help them and train them up to step up into actually running their own things versus like me doing anything or me trying to like stick around and take credit for things and all that. Right. In terms of professional or personal goals, what's your long game? Who or what are you chasing? That's a good question. Um, I like in the long term, I kind of like the trajectory we're on and I like being able to have my hand in different things but not being ultimately like day-to-day -day responsible for any of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I like, and I like doing my own things too. So I, I know I've talked to other business owners who've like gotten out of the operations of their business and then they're putting money into like other people's businesses. Um, and that doesn't drive me. Uh, I, it drives me in a sense of like, I would love to help other people that I know and work with and help them like take something and run with it but I also like to have somewhat of a vested interest in it, if that makes sense. Like I'm not going to like run and go do a restaurant or something like something I would never, that has zero appeal to me, but continuing to kind of do what we're doing where it's like, how do we make our lives better and easier? How do we make our clients lives better and easier? Like Wordable, for instance, we are a customer of Wordable for almost since the beginning. So it's like Benji and Debesh created it in 2016. Um, we use it on a daily basis as a customer still. And I run into a lot of the same problems and pain points other people have. And we perform that service manually for clients. So it was a very natural extension or fit to be like, oh, well, I think we could do something interesting with it and take it in a different direction to help solve like these other problems that we keep seeing uh, in the same space. So that, that type of thing is super interesting to me. And I like just doing new things and getting better and trying and experimenting. That is a lot of fun to me. So in a weird way, I still work a lot and a lot of hours and stuff, but I don't, it's still, it's, it's super enjoyable to me. And it's not like the hard hustling of working a lot to try and just pay the bills, you know, tomorrow or next week or whatever. Yeah. That's a great answer. It's, it's like, there's this book uh, I read a while back that I, I don't think I fully understood to be honest, but it's called infinite versus finite games or something like that. And it sounds like your infinite game, the game that you the goal is to keep playing is more so building and tinkering. Whereas like yeah. finite games could be, you know, built within that. It could be like to get the agency to this level of revenue or to exit this company or whatever. But it's like your ideal day in the life is just to keep tinkering and building and learning new stuff. Yeah, for sure. Like in the last, I don't know, year, uh, about a year, a little over a year ago, I moved to Hawaii. And so that's where I'm at right now. It's probably why my internet cut out. I'm on a remote island. Um, and and I get to like spend all day just like working on interesting stuff and get to eat sushi every day for lunch. And so it's like, that's already like, that's already a win to me. And I get to like go spend time with my family. I don't have to go do the dog and pony show of like flying to clients to, to like impress them and pitch them. And like, no, I don't have to do any of that stuff. I can kind of like, I'm at the point now where I'm not like going to retire, but I don't, I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. And I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like being able to do what's interesting, what's intellectually interesting to me. Uh, and, and at the same time, like I said, help figure out how do we get something to work and get off the ground? And then how do we get other people to step in and run it? And that's like, that's super rewarding for me too. Cause it's kind of, it becomes life-changing then for other people as well. And so that's, uh, that's awesome. I, it's, I don't just, I don't get fulfillment out of just like passively putting money into crypto and like watching it go up and down, you know, like that. I just, I, I'm not like more stressful have, than anything to me for sure. And I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I don't have skin in the game either. So it's like, it doesn't. It doesn't make me feel anything other than, like you said, like dumb anxiety. Right. So wh where did you move from? Like, where were you at before Hawaii? I was in Denver for a couple of years. Uh, and I liked that a lot. And I actually grew up in California before that. Has it has moving changed your outlook on productivity and, and how you structure your day? Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's a very slow, quiet place, which is nice because I log online or and it's crazy and it's fast paced and I'm like doing too many things. So it's nice to have that balance of um, almost like optimizing the rest of my life to fit like my professional goals that I want to achieve and go after. Meaning um, like I take calls that I want to take. I don't take calls that I don't want to take. So I'm, I'm literally 12 hours away from people in Europe 
uh, I want to, re- I have to really want to talk to those people to be able to like get up at, you know, 4am to talk to them or whatever time. So, uh, and then it's a very slow place outside of that in that I'm not sitting in traffic and commuting. I'm not, people here aren't like, you know, driving at least, uh, at least not on this Island, not on uh, maybe on Oahu, like where the city is, but it's not a, it's just a different type of place. That's the people around you that you're, once you shut all this down and go outside, your family and the people around you, the interface with aren't driven by money like they are in the tech space, which is not, it's a nice like balance for someone like me who's crazy uh, and just wants to do like a million things uh, as fast as possible. Yeah, I've talked about this many times. I think I would be a natural fit for New York City, but I don't think I would like the person that I would be in New York City. I think sure. that all of my drives and like natural inclinations would fit in so well, but that's why I don't want to be there. And I also feel just a natural, like it's really inherent to me. Like it's obvious that cities and your surroundings give you a different quality of thinking or different vibes. Yeah. Um, so it's really important where you choose to be. And it sounds like Hawaii, I, I don't know, I'm inferring a little bit in terms of like before this, but it sounds like you were a little more always on, so to speak. And now you've got more time to rest, recharge, think, reflect, and, and maybe now you can pour more directed energy when you are working. For sure. Yeah. I think your priorities evolve over time. And I have kids too. And my kids are like, my oldest one's getting older now. She's nine. So I think that also plays into it where uh, you begin to realize how quickly this stressful, but like amazing period in life gets shorter and shorter mm-hmm. and how quickly it goes. And you don't want to like miss it because you're sitting in traffic, driving to LA to go pitch a client that does probably doesn't even like you and you don't like them. You know, like you're like that kind of my priorities in life have just shifted a lot based on uh, based on like family and personal stuff too. So my, th- again, that doesn't mean to say I don't want to make money or whatever, because it's an expensive place to live. You know, I got to, got to fly a lot, but I was in, right. uh, I, I went to a conference in Vegas like a month or two ago. And like the first day or two was great. Cause it's like fast and awesome restaurants, and all this stuff. But then after like two or three days, I'm like, it's, I gotta get out of here. Like it's loud and it's bright and I can't like go to sleep at night without like feeling the base of some club in my chest. You know, like I just need to turn that off and get back to like a quiet place. Ultimately. I feel that every time I go to New York city, that's so yeah. funny. Do you feel or fear that um, being in a quieter place makes you decrease your ambition? And is there an inverse correlation between happiness and ambition? That's a good question. I don't think there is for me. I feel happy when I'm working on stuff, mm-hmm. but I don't like accomplish something in a day, meaning like, could be anything. It could be a, whatever. I don't write that much anymore, but it could be like an article. It could be like getting a, getting substantial progress done on this project I'm working on, or, um, that makes me feel more anxious and stressful in a way. And maybe this is all personality driven, but I, I feel happiest or satisfied when I do get something done. Um, rather than when I'm just like chilling on the beach, that's fun too, but I almost like, I can't rest and chill on the beach until I've gotten something done. That's like my personal uh, issue, I guess, or hang up or a mental flaw. You know, I have that. I think it just depends again on the person. I'm not the, but it is um, the, the opposite of that though, is it is nice being in a place that other people force you to not be a crazy asshole. You know, like uh, you're, when you're here, you need to drive slow. You need to let people go in front of you. You need to know that like the hours on someone's food truck, uh, are not that realistic. And sometimes they're late and sometimes they close early and sometimes the surf is good. So no businesses are open. And sometimes it's far, far, hard to find reliable, like quick uh, attention around here. Cause it's not, people aren't geared towards that. They're geared towards like taking care of community and other things. So it's for me and my kind of like crazy aggressive personality, it's, it's a good thing because it forces me to balance, but I, I could still log online and still be that, that crazy asshole for, you know, a couple hours out of the day. It's, it sounds like a lot of that is intrinsic as opposed to extrinsically motivated as well. But um, that, I think that so. notion of uh, <laughs> the environment forcing you to slow down is so funny because I, I remember acutely being in Spain a couple of years ago and I was frustrated at like slow service and like restaurants that weren't open at this hour and all that stuff. Yeah. And it took me a couple of days to realize, wait, 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 I'm the problem. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I need to slow down. I, I can't just like, you know, think that the whole world's going to operate like Chicago or something like that. Totally. Yeah. It's, it, I, I'd like to think that I'm like trying to be, be a better person, you know, because I try to take more time to 
recognize that it's a privilege to be here and live here and that uh, for, for a number of different reasons. Um, so uh, I'd like to think that it kind of forces you definitely to like actually care about other people more and be a more empathetic person, which I'm not naturally, uh, admittedly. And so, um, but yeah, I think I couldn't, I don't think I, in saying that, I couldn't do it if there wasn't like internet and Amazon and, or if I, I still will like order food while I'm on a phone call and go pick it up so I don't have to wait. I know it's going to take, you know, 45 minutes when I sit there. So I'm just going to order it ahead of time. And so you, you learned to, you learn to cope, you know, you learn right. to cope. Yeah. With, you uh, don't want to retire to the beach yet. <laughs> no, no, no. I still have like too many things. And like, to your point, I don't, the reason I'm doing all this stuff, I think it just depends on what makes you happy too. Like I like doing new things and starting new things and trying new things. It, I don't want to be like, you know, on Forbes every day, like that kind of stuff doesn't motivate me. So I think it's just part of that too, is just figuring out how do you optimize your lifestyle based on what you do or do get enjoyment from. Yeah, for sure. Well, it goes back to that tinkerer's mindset. I've talked to my co-founders about this, about this concept of burnout is very, uh, it's talked about nowadays, which I think is a good thing overall, but I think some of it misses the point um, and kind of denigrates hard work. Whereas like I sure. kind of get refueled from hard work completed. Whereas if yep. I sit around doing nothing, that anxiety and burnout tends to rise actually paradoxically. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's not to go off a slippery slope into like mental health too. Cause it's like, I get it. And it is a good thing overall that we're becoming more aware and conscious of these things. But at the same time, it's like when I was, you know, broke and struggling, I didn't have the like benefit of claiming mental health and like, you know, not paying my rent, like people <laughs> like, to, or like not paying a hospital bill for my kids. Like they, people, you know, people, you gotta, you, you gotta, the hard work isn't a bad thing to your point. I totally agree. I think that's, I think that's the message. Hard work doesn't mean you get burned out or you have mental health issues or you have anxiety. Like hard work should mean you're growing as a person. And that's a good kind of tension. Um, like I, I do struggle. I I'm, tr I'm saying I'm trying to become a more empathetic person. I'm going to now say something that completely contradicts that, but it's like, I, I struggle with this concept of like, Oh, well, it's okay if everyone's like obese. It's okay mm -hmm. if everyone like doesn't want to work hard. It's like, well, it's not though. Like being obese is going to cause you so many more problems in your life. Like the, like so many health issues are related to that. You're at higher risk for things like COVID. Like that's not a good thing. Like we should still be trying to improve. Like, yeah, we shouldn't be rude to those people or we shouldn't be like tearing them down. We should be building them up. But at the same time, let's not like lie to everyone. Let's, let's not, not sugarcoat let's this. Not yeah. Be, let's not be snowflakes and like <laughs> pretend like it's a good thing when it's objectively not a good thing. Like there's so many problems with whatever being obese or even I think of like people who retire and don't work and then they just kind of lose their mind after a while, you know, mm -hmm. and totally. that, that, that's good. You, you need me. a mission. You need some sort of a purpose. Totally. Yeah. So I think, I, I, I don't think hard work is a good thing. It can definitely be, you can definitely go overboard with it, but it's, it's, a good thing, like going back to the hunter gatherer days, like the, we, we did hard work. We've done hard work for centuries and I think it's a good thing. And I don't think uh, we should shy away from that in fear of um, whatever, whatever culture we're coming up with in 2021. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, not to go further down the, the slippery <laughs> yeah. slope, but I, do, yeah, I think I that wait. the people that I talk to that, um, that believe in hard work, that have that ethos, like they they all came from a background where they, they had to do it. Right. Like it was, it yeah. was pulling themselves up and actually had to work hard to get to the place they are. And there's sort of a gratitude and reverence for it. Maybe it's an addiction to it. Maybe it is unhealthy, but I yeah. do feel like there is a difference in somebody's background and being able to say like, Oh yeah, we should just rest and like self-care. And, <laughs> and right. obviously that stuff is important. You should rest and recharge in a weird way. It actually gives back to the ability to work hard and that maybe shouldn't be your entire life. But yeah, there, there is a delineation between the types of people in the backgrounds that I see, you know, in, in how they value just like accomplishment and, and getting things done. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's like, it, and it may, this is probably selfish, but it's like, I feel good when I can go to a restaurant, like a local restaurant and also tip 50%. But like, I can't do that if I'm not like then also working hard. <laughs> totally. So it's like, you can't have one without the other. You can't like support other people and be, and be kind in different ways and like, uh, whatever. Uh, be a generous person, but you can't be a generous person if you have nothing to give. Totally. I think that's a that's a big problem with like uh, where this 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 weird uh, this weird kind of place that we're all in you know, as a society, um, where people are becoming like 
more insular as as rules and other things want us to like not communicate and talk to each other and interface or even see each other's faces. It's it's becoming I don't know I think it's becoming uh, counterproductive in a sense. It ha- it's like most things. It's founded on good ideology, but it's being implemented poorly. Maybe is the way I totally. I, I almost think we should end here and we're almost coming up on time, but I want to ask you one more question on content marketing, if that's cool. Yeah, good. I would rather, I'd prefer not to get canceled today. Uh, so the <laughs> further away hardest. we can move, the further away <laughs> we can move from that, the better. Um, well, I actually have a contrarian question, but I don't, I don't think we'll get canceled for it. Uh, okay. It's like that Peter Thiel question. What's something you believe about content marketing that few people would agree with you on? Oh, oh man. Um, that's a good question. I'd have to, uh, I'd have to go a couple different ways with it. Uh, the the mm-hmm. one off the top of my head, cause it maybe it's come up a few times in this talk already, but it's, um, like stop losing the forest to the trees or whatever terrible metaphor that is like in our rush, s- smart people tend to overcomplicate things. And in our rush, uh, and our, again, good ideology of wanting to like make something the best it could possibly be that often works counter to the goal of like making more money from this. And so at a certain point, we just need to say, this is good enough. It doesn't need to be amazing. Cause I think to your, you even said earlier, like, like readers, the audience doesn't care if you use an M dash or an M dash, like they don't, they don't, they probably don't even know the difference. Uh, and they <laughs> definitely certainly don't care. And so uh, too many times smart people in our field get stuck in the weeds and they focus too much, almost too much on quality or what in their mind is quality. When in reality, it's just like this, this needs to be good enough and you need to do way more of it and you need to move like faster at higher volumes. Typically for most companies, that's the problem for most companies. If they're going to go from like zero or even six figures a year in revenue to seven or eight or 10. It's not, it's usually not like, it's not just like, oh, this needs to be better quality. It's like, no, but you also need to do a hundred more of those and, a, you know, a thousand times faster. Yeah. I love that. I mean, the style thing I've, I've talked about before, uh, I think at the margins, it's important. It's like, if you're Gary Vaynerchuk, like your style is very important, but for the 90% of people where nobody gives a shit about your style and personal brand, yeah. nobody cares. Um, uh, a blog Company blogs too, this drives me nuts. Like company blogs want every single article to sound exactly the same. Yeah, but it's and always like, this like middle ground of like they they say like informal yet professional, which doesn't mean yeah, and, and it's and too it's like well, don't you have more than one person in your company? Right. Like, why wouldn't you want like three different styles on your blog? It's it's more interesting to people. Like, it creates like different points of views. That's a good thing. That's not. I mean, so, the yeah, Atlantic I, I, or any sort of like publication yeah. you look at, they've got writers and they've got voices. A million percent. Like you read the Economist or the Atlantic, any any really good the New Yorker, there is a style overall, but one article to the next is going to sound very different and that's, that's okay. You know, like that's, there, there's still room for that. And don't, I think too many times people's pursuit of perfection uh, just kind of goes overboard. Cause again, we're not, this isn't Tesla or like uh, SpaceX. We're not building space shuttles. It doesn't have to be exactly perfect. Right. Like we're just, we're just trying to like make people laugh and interested and give a crap about what we're trying to talk about. I love that. That was perfect. I'm glad I asked that question. Um, I want to be mindful of your time. So do you want to mention where people can find you online? Anything you want to point people to? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you could go to codeless.io or usurp, U-S-E-R-P. Uh, it's, a, it's a play on words. It's very clever or stupid, depending on who gets the joke. Um, or wordable.io. Those places are all great. I'm on LinkedIn, but to be honest, I'm not really active on LinkedIn. Like I said, I'm probably trying to eat sushi or hang out with my family. So uh, don't follow me there or any other social plan- channels. Just go to one of those company websites. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Brad. This was awesome. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it. 